Welcome to Fantastic History. I'm Sarah. And I'm Clay. We're a husband and wife duo who enjoy telling each other about amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history. Now, Clay, I would say our marriage is damn near perfect. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, but there's something about you that genuinely bothers me this time of year. Oh, that's good. Um, is this is this a fantastic therapy? It it really should be, but um, <laughs> what what really really grinds my gears about you, honey, is the fact that you don't like eggnog. Yeah, I uh, I would much prefer a uh, a hot chocolate. <laughs> okay, with great. a peppermint stick <laughs> and an eggnog. But to be fair, um. I don't drink a lot of spiked um, heavy drinks, so I'm sure an eggnog that's spiked is a lot is a lot more um, enjoyable because you get a little bit more out of it. Yeah, I would say so, but you know, a lot of people drink it um, not being spiked. Like for me, I could go either way. Like I'll I'll take it as is. I'll take it with a shot. But you know, what's wild to me is that it's it's not even just you who doesn't like it. Uh, no. Best friend of the podcast, Melanie, who was just here a couple weeks ago, um, is also not into it, which yeah, I found out when she came to visit us two Christmases ago. And I was like, please tell me you like eggnog so I can buy some to drink. And she was like, nah, sick. What's really? wrong with you? Yeah. That is pretty surprising because it's like a, it's like a, it's an American classic. Right. Well, I mean, you're just as American as she is. So there you go. But like, it's not even just you guys. None of my close friends who I might see around the holidays, none of them like it. Wow. And it, it basically keeps me from getting to enjoy eggnog because there's simply no way, and especially as a type 1 diabetic, that I'd be able to finish an entire carton of it by myself before it went bad. Like, <laughs> I would make myself so sick if I tried to do that, and no one will drink it with me. Yeah, that's my, true. My only hope is that our kid will like it when he's a little bit older. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm SOL on this. That is really surprising. Yeah, it's it's a super bummer. Although maybe that's a good thing if the story I've brought you today is any indication. Oh, the lead in. Have you ever heard of the eggnog riot? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think I'm about to. You are. So this festive bit of nonsense took place on Christmas Eve, 1826 at West Point Academy. Mm. For those of you who may not be familiar with West Point, it's a military academy in New York that's part of a post of the same name. The original fort was constructed during the American Revolutionary War under the watchful gaze and strict orders of none other than General George Washington himself. It has the distinction of being the longest continually occupied military post in the country. So it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. It's also really, really difficult to be accepted into the military academy at West Point. Not only do you have to jump through all the usual hoops that you would with any other prestigious university, but you also have to be nominated for the position by a member of Congress. Really? Oh, yeah. So this is like mega elite if you want to get into this school. No kidding. When they first opened their doors in 1802, it accepted only 10 applicants. Wow. Unlike with other colleges and universities, there was no school year necessarily. And new members could join at any time as long as they met that high bar criteria. Things were relatively loosey-goosey in that fashion for the first decade. But then came the War of 1812, which was basically an epilogue chapter to the Revolutionary War. Hmm. Congress started taking the whole thing more seriously because they wanted to have the absolute best of the best for America's military. And to that end, they appointed Colonel Sylvanius Thayer as the superintendent at West Point. Sylvanius. Sylvanius, which is like... Such a wild name. Let's bring that back. That's pretty proper. Can you imagine meeting a baby and the parents being like, "Here, here's little baby Sylvanius. That would fly today. That would be so wild, though. I would love to see it. He goes by Sylvie. Is your baby named Sylvanius? Right in. Now, 
Sylvanius Thayer, who was born in Braintree, Massachusetts. Now, he was the cream of the crop when it came to being a hard ass. He basically made West Point what it is today in terms of its strict level of discipline and its global renown. A majority of the traditions and policies still in place at West Point Academy today were originally put in place by Thayer more than 200 years ago. Success at West Point with Thayer at the helm was dependent on physical and mental discipline, unfailing honor and responsibility, and sky-high academic standards. To that end, based on his own expertise on the subject, West Point was able to boast the very first engineering college in the country. Mm, Wow. Yeah. Other things that were implemented during his reign were things like summer encampment, a dress code as rigid as that of the actual military, and most relevant to our story, a demerit system. Hmm. I think we've talked about this before, but did your school have demerits? I don't really remember that like being a thing. School? That was it was uh that was very much the punishment system at my school. Um like even in elementary school, like elementary all the way through high school, if you got in trouble, teachers would give you demerits, like however much they thought you deserved for your transgressions, like something minor but still bad, like you would get two demerits. And they'd write out a little slip and send it like send you with your slip to the principal's office so Mm. it could be put on your record like oh my god and if you ended up accruing 12 demerits you had you got suspended but if you did something really bad they would give you eight straight which meant automatic suspension oh man so that became the thing like eight straight oh my god he got eight straight eight straight oh my god like that phrase is burned into my brain because like that's how you knew somebody messed up bad that's funny i don't think that was a thing at my school but then again i was a i was a very good student okay but you still would have heard about other people getting demerits so get off your high horse (laughs) yeah (sighs) now i'd say even with all those other credits to his name it was his strictness that sylvanius was best known for and it's certainly the quality most relevant to our story When he took charge, he started banning stuff left, right, and center. Things like, I mean, cadets weren't allowed to have playing cards or novels. Mm. They certainly weren't allowed to drink, with two notable exceptions. West Point sanctioned parties with alcohol on Independence Day and Christmas. But even that ended up getting banned after just a few years when the cadets went absolutely bananas on July 4th of 1825. I couldn't find a ton of information about how out of hand things got, except that at one point, a lot of the guys started doing a snake dance and several others hoisted the commandant of cadets, William Worth, on their shoulders and hauled him across campus despite his very loud protests. Uh. <laughs> And for those wondering snake dance, I looked it up because I didn't know what they were talking about, but it kind of just, it, it's, it's almost like a conga line, basically. Like it's just a, a, you get in a line and you're just kind of moving in a serpentine pattern. Okay. It's just kind of, kind of picture it like a conga line. It doesn't sound so bad. No, but like unbecoming of someone in military dress uniform, probably. (laughs) I don't know. Probably. From then on, you know, whatever the snake dance, you know, situation was, alcohol in any form was strictly forbidden. Mm. If a cadet had permission to leave campus, there was a tavern just across the Hudson River, but they were by no means allowed to return to West Point with a drink in their hand. And honestly, the best practice was to be completely sobered up before you went back. Yeah. There was one student in particular who repeatedly ran afoul of this rule extreme racist and legendary villain jefferson davis who would go on to become the president of the confederacy hey yeah that guy that guy so just a quick note for anybody who uh, still isn't getting it um all confederates and supporters of the confederacy past and present are enemies of and traitors to america bloop that is true anyway jefferson was a legendary pisshead in many ways And during his time at West Point, this was defined primarily by his inability to stay sober despite those rules. 
In one particularly notable instance of this, during his third year at the academy, he was hanging out in the tavern I mentioned when he got word that one of the officers was heading that way looking for him. He goes running out the door, hoping to disappear into the woods and sneak back onto campus. Problem is, it's dark as shit, and especially in the woods. Sure. Without being able to see more than a foot in front of his face, he ended up falling into a ravine and getting so badly injured that he was in the infirmary for months afterwards. Ah. Yeah. As he was convalescing, a group of his classmates started plotting a way to get alcohol onto campus for Christmas Eve that year to reinstate the tradition of the cadets sharing some spiked eggnog to celebrate the holiday. Okay. Seems reasonable. It it does. I yeah. mean, especially because, like, this guy just, like, totally ate it <laughs> coming home. And it's like, well, we don't want to be that guy. So let's find a way to bring it onto campus so we don't have to, you know, run through the woods. Yeah, good idea. Now, a few days before Christmas that same year, Cadet T.M. Lewis smuggled in a gallon of rum from that nearby tavern, Mm. while Cadets William Burnley, Alexander Center, and Samuel Roberts, quote unquote, borrowed one of the Academy's rowboats and headed up the Hudson, where they purchased whiskey, brandy, rum, and wine from a few different local taverns. Dang. They then bribed Private James Dugan, one of the school's guards, with a whopping 35 cents to let them bring their contraband onto campus. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Like, sure, 35 cents sounds really cheap, but I bet with inflation, it's actually a pretty impressive amount in today's money. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to go ahead and guess that it's it's really not. It's really not. This man let them smuggle alcohol onto campus for a little under eleven dollars. Yeah, in today's money, that's a, that's that's kind of what I was thinking. Eleven bucks? Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Honestly, if I was gonna break military laws and like get into the worst trouble I can probably imagine, yeah, I'd be way way more expensive than that. Well, you you'd think that they would at least be like, if I'm gonna. If I'm gonna put my cards on the table in front of this guy, I'm gonna mm. give him more than a tenner. Yeah, you would think. You really would. If I'm like gonna run that risk of getting court martialed, like I need to be able to pay for a week at like Tokyo Disney Sea with like transformation and food money and like souvenir budget included. You know what I mean? So if anyone out there is thinking about mm-hmm. uh, bribing Sarah, yes, please that clip that because that is exactly what you would have to do i mean you're looking at a minimum of like 20 grand i'm i'm relatively cheap it really depends what you want me to do but that is that is my starting price yeah so just keep that in mind anyway private dugan who clearly does not know his own worth and probably needs a hug let them bring in their whiskey where it was hidden throughout a series of dorm rooms just in case one of the rooms got inspected before the party like, it's better to lose some of the booze instead of all of it, right? Sure. Like, they knew they were treading water here. And their worries weren't unfounded, because the closer it got to Christmas, the more certain Sylvanius Thayer became that the cadets were going to start acting up. <laughs> Thayer hosted a Christmas Eve party of his own for some of the officers. Hypocritically, he did serve wine to his guests. I know, but I suppose in all fairness, like most adults are more trustworthy around alcohol at an upscale party than like college age guys are in their dorms. It's it's probably a given. Yeah. So, you know, I'll I'll let it slide this time. The party lasted the fancy party lasted from 5:45 p.m. until a reasonable 9:30 with entertainment being provided by the West Point band. At some point during the festivities, Thayer pulled aside two of his best guys, Captain Ethan Hitchcock and Lieutenant William Thornton, and asked them to keep an eye out for him on Christmas Eve. At least one of them needed to be awake and alert all night long to make sure there were no rule-breaking shenanigans. Mm -hmm. No funny business. No funny business. And then, for reasons I don't fully understand but can nevertheless relate to, Thayer washed his hands of the whole thing and settled himself down for a long winter's nap. Wow. And he's like, y'all are in charge. Bye. <laughs> I got to be asleep when Santa comes. That's the rules. It's Christmas Eve. You got you, you don't want to stay up. No. 
God, no. Yeah. While all the big guys were busy with their classy Christmas, though, the cadets were in full-on party planning mode. Working in staggered groups, they started gathering together the booze and sneaking food out of the mess hall. Everything seemed pretty chill and normal until just after midnight. Mm. I guess wanting to make sure Santa had already determined the whole naughty nice breakdown and delivered gifts accordingly. Probably. Like once it's 1201, you're in the clear. Around 70 cadets gathered in the North Barracks and started celebrating the season of light by getting lit. Mm. Now, this wasn't supposed to be a rager. This was supposed to be more like secretly reinstating a former West Point tradition of sharing a glass of eggnog or two with your bros. And it was that for about the first two hours or so. Sure. Then around two o'clock in the morning... A couple of the guys started singing just a bit too loudly. It's always a couple of guys that just can't handle it. Oh, always. The noise woke up Captain Hitchcock, who had started dozing during his watch. He tracked down the source of the noise, which was a small handful of drunken cadets who had broken off into a smaller party of their own in the barracks just above Hitchcock's quarters. So the good news is it was like a sub party. It wasn't the main thing. They got right, that going for him. Right above his office, they're right singing Christmas it. carols, yeah. drunk. Not even his office, like his bedroom. Like, are you out of your mind? Did You wanted to get caught? Foolishness. Yeah. They, they, they were impaired. <laughs> Clearly were not thinking straight. <laughs> oh. He told them to shut up and go to bed, and they did. Okay. He'd been busted, like he busted them cold. He looked around, knew the faces, the names, like you don't want to push it. They went to bed. God bless him. Hitchcock thought that was going to be the end of it, and he went back to bed. So he's supposed to be on guard. Yes. Hitchcock and Thornton are the ones supposed to be, you know, keeping an eye on things. But he was like, no, 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 no. I, you know what? I found the guys who were partying. I sent them off to bed. They followed my orders. I'm actually in the clear to sleep now where I wasn't before. I'm going to get like proper comfy this time. That's a good point. Yeah. So, you know. Give him some credit, I guess. Mm, Except that a couple hours later, he got woken up again. Mm. And this time he found what surely must be the jackpot because he came across a much bigger group of loud, drunk guys being led in their revelry by none other than party boy Jeff Davis. Oh, he's he's back on his feet. He's back on his feet uh, and drunk off his ass like... But you know, like this is this is the shit stirrer. This is the guy who's constantly getting into shenanigans, starting trouble. And I found him. This party's bigger. Like, okay, and I've, ma- I've got it on lock now. And by this point, it's about four a.m. It's around on Christmas four. Day. Yes. <laughs> While Hitchcock was busy fussing at this second group of cadets, Davis slipped off and went hauling ass down the hall to where an even bigger group of cadets was gathered. He literally kicked down the door and yelled, put away the grog. Captain Hitchcock is coming. (laughs) Unfortunately, though, unsurprisingly, this brought Hitchcock right to their door. Yeah. Mm, Drunk people are so much louder than they think. (laughs) From personal experience, no shade. (laughs) While Davis slinked off with his tail between his legs and locked himself in his room like a little coward, Hitchcock began to read those other cadets the riot act. Literally. Yeah, for our longtime listeners, I discussed the Riot Act back in episode 39 when I told the true stories behind some common idioms. Yeah, I remember that. I I listened to that episode. You did? Yeah. That's great. Me too. Um, So anybody else who did, you already know what I mean by that. But for anybody who hasn't heard the episode or who may not remember something they listened to like a year ago... Mm. The Riot Act was originally a British law that several of its colonies adopted for a while. And it basically said that groups of 12 or more people were against the law. Like you could not gather in groups of 12 or more. And there were, I believe, 17 guys in this room. So against the law, good day to you. Because the Riot Act was still in effect in America at that time. Yeah. Crazy. After four hours of drinking, though... None of these cadets were super interested in British laws or this total nerd stumbling up in here (laughs) trying to destroy their vibes. To the contrary, one of them yelled, get your dirks and bayonets and pistols if you have them. Before this night is over, Hitchcock will be dead. 
Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's really bad. It's probably as bad as it can get if you're Hitchcock. Yeah, Uh that's a nightmare. I imagine this as like a very cinematic scene, but like comedy cinema where everything goes quiet for a minute after the guy says it. Like Uh Hitchcock is staring at them. And they're staring back at him and everything is frozen for like just a second. Yeah. But then Hitchcock takes off running and this pack of drunk guys goes scrambling for their weapons <laughs> to like chase him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah. Poor Hitchcock. This so is, this is bad. It's real bad. So those whose quarters were nearby actually did go grab their bayonets, muskets and pistols, while others had to improvise by taking up swords, sticks and rocks. And the whole group went on the prowl, literally hunting Hitchcock. No. Oh, yes. At one point, a cadet shot at him from point blank range. And Hitchcock was only saved because another rioter jostled the shooter at the at the last second. Oh, my God. Only this reason he didn't crazy. get his face blown off. Yep. So Hitchcock skedaddled to call in reinforcements. And in the meanwhile, West Point turned into Cadets Gone Wild. Oh, no. They smashed windows and plates, threw furniture, and ripped the banisters off the stairs. Oh, man. It was an actual frenzied mob. On Christmas Day. Christmas Day. Lieutenant Thornton finally woke the fuck up. Uh, The Uh other guy who was supposed to be on watch um, showed up (laughs) at the scene, but was quickly dispatched when a cadet hit him in the face with a two by four and knocked him out cold. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Thinking that Hitchcock was going to call in the bombardiers who were their natural enemy, several of the cadets started barricading all the windows and doors and in the process pretty much destroying all of the windows and doors. It wasn't until Commandant Worth, who I mentioned earlier, rocked up on the scene that the eggnog riot of 1826 came to an end. Worth was a distinguished war veteran who was not to be trifled with, and the cadets knew it. It was him being harassed at that 4th of July party that got alcohol banned in the first place, Mm. if you'll recall. So he's not putting up with anything. I also feel like by that point, a lot of the alcohol had probably like burned out of their systems. But, yeah. You know, it's been four hours and like you're running around crazy, like kicking guys' asses. Like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's yeah. this is this is crazy. It's crazy. But like there's also the fact that like eggnog makes you feel like kind of full and sloppy and cozy. So the fellows were probably like ready to be done anyway. But by this point it's almost dawn, right? It's six o'clock. They've been drinking for six at hours. least six hours. Six hours minimum. Yeah. I don't see how they have the energy at this point. Because they're cause, cause <laughs> teenagers. Well, if they were just drinking straight liquor Mm -hmm. that's one thing but if they were drinking egg and 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 they probably were Uh, by then i'm sure they're drinking it straight if they were drinking egg no you think they'd be fat happy bloated Uh uh-huh worn down Mm -hmm. yeah 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 you would think that but just keep in mind we're talking about like teenage boys yep and you're in a dorm you're with your bros like you're all kind of agging each other on Things can get out of hand. Clearly. When Reveille was played the next morning at 6.05, the familiar trumpeting was enlivened by the percussive sounds of glass breaking and screamed profanities. Mm. The smoke finally began to clear as the two-thirds of the cadets who didn't participate in the free-for-all began to aid in the ceasefire and the ensuing cleanup efforts. So one-third of the cadets were part of this. Just went ballistic the others were in the south dormitories like this all took (laughs) place in the north dormitories and all the guys in like the other bunks were just like honk shoe honk shoe you know missions of sugar plums you think they hear a gunshot and be like uh what yeah i'm not quite sure how far apart these barracks were like yeah i mean who knows imagine waking up and 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 being and seeing what your your (laughs) Your peers have done. <laughs> Seeing the other barracks like completely destroyed, like what Thornton's got this huge goose egg on his forehead from being whacked with a two by four, like 
the other guy, he's got like bullet holes in his coat. <laughs> he just like, what? The, what what happened like, last night what did i sleep through like were we attacked oh my god yeah. in the end though there were about 90 confirmed participants only 22 of them could be confirmed by superior officers who had witnessed their malfeasance and those men were placed under house arrest of course this included jefferson davis mm-hmm. the inquiry that followed boasted no less than 167 witnesses and in the end, 17 of the accused were expelled from West Point as a result of their participation in the eggnog riot, though four of them were later granted clemency. Another participant named John Archibald Campbell had his expulsion called for, but it ended up being rejected. They let him stay. And after his graduation from West Point, he went on to become a Supreme Court justice. Oh, my God. Yeah. And then four or five of the guys who were expelled from West Point went on to become Confederate officers. You know, you hear <laughs> stuff like this and you think, you know, it, it's a bit it's a bit reassuring that things have always been sort of fucked. Yeah. <laughs> and insane. And there's yep. been clowns running the show since like just the very beginning. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. You think you think things are bad now, but they've pretty much always been just Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a circus yes always that, that it you know this is the season of hope and that's what <laughs> i hope to bring to you guys by sharing this story of how like pretty much everyone from the 1800s was a dumb dick except for probably lincoln <laughs> well maybe <laughs> maybe like as far as the record shows but I mean, I I did tell you guys he did own a bar. Yeah, Lincoln owned his own bar. He was a bartender, bar owner, and ended up having to sell his half of the bar because the other owner simply could not stay sober. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So that's where the story ends of the eggnog riots. But it's Christmas, so I want to end on a happier note. Okay. And for that, I have a special treat for you guys, and especially. Those of you who are on the right side of history and enjoy the most delicious drink of the season. Mm. What I have for you here is a recipe written by the founder of West Point, George Washington. And this is Washington's recipe for eggnog. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So this is fun. So for this, you'll need one quart cream, one quart milk. One dozen tablespoons of sugar, which if you don't want to have to like measure out (laughs) tablespoons because that's nuts, um, that would be, I think, a cup. It's either a cup or a fourth a cup. You know, I need to really check that math. Yeah, it's pretty different. Yes, it is. So wait, a dozen tablespoons, 12, four. Yeah, that's a fourth of a cup. Okay. No, it's not. It's a cup. It's a cup. Okay, moving on. Starting over. I don't want to confuse your recipe. I'm just going to go with the tablespoons. So one quart cream, one quart milk, one dozen tablespoons of sugar, asterisk possibly one cup, one pint brandy, half pint whiskey, half pint Jamaican rum, quarter pint sherry. Oh, my God. George Washington was fucked up up on Christmas. (laughs) This man thought there was two Santas. Oh, my God. Okay, so you take all that. He was seeing those ghosts. Yes, he was. (laughs) That's why, so this is like a little known trivia fact, but that's why there are two Marleys in the Muppet Christmas Carol, because that's how many Washington saw. (laughs) There are two Jacob Marleys. That's crazy. (laughs) And it was just Martha. It was. That's what's so messed up. She was just pale, George. (laughs) Messed up. So you mix the liquor together first. Then you separate the egg yolks from the whites. You add sugar to the beaten yolks. So you beat the yolks. You add the sugar to the yolks. You mix that really well. You add the milk and the cream to the egg mixture. Beat that more slowly. Be careful. This is liquids. Then beat the whites of the eggs like on their own until they're stiff. So you're you're not wanting to do stiff peaks like a meringue, but you want it to kind of hold the shape. Once you've done that, you want to fold the egg whites slowly into the mixture because you don't want to deflate all that air. Then you're going to let the concoction set in a cool place for several days before serving. So it's going to set 
out. Yeah, so they didn't have refrigerators. So, okay. but like that's kind of how because you you're only drinking it in the winter months, you want to set it out somewhere that's going to stay cold because you don't want it to spoil. You don't want to accidentally start cooking the eggs. Yeah, and but you kind of it's one of those things where sometimes like I'm baking cookies today, rather a lot of cookies, like an insane abnormal amount of cookies. And with a lot of the dough, you want to let it set up for a while so the flavors can really mix. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's why you're setting it aside for a few days. Okay. I don't know. But there you have it. A very fantastic history Christmas. Oh, lovely. Yeah, we hope you found this episode fun and festive. And if you did, please give us the gift of a five-star rating and a glowing review on whatever podcast platform you use. You can find us on Instagram and threads at Fantastic HPod and on TikTok as Fantastic History Podcast. If your Christmas list includes a story you'd like us to cover, feel free to have Santa direct your wish to FantasticHistoryPod at gmail.com. Until next time, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas.